Hello, welcome to Security Insights. I'm Gunnar Peterson, CISO at Forder, a trust platform for digital commerce. And today I have two great guests from Token Security, Itamar Appelblatt and Leah Zuckerman. From Token Security, Itamar is a second-time entrepreneur with more than 15 years in cybersecurity. He led R&D sections inside of Israeli Intelligence Unit 8200, founded a fintech company before coming to Token Security. And on the other side, Leah Zuckerman comes with a background in venture capital, helping early-stage startups in achieving product market fit and go-to-market fit. Leah moved to Israel about six years ago to complete a master's in public policy and conflict resolution, and she now leads a go-to-market motion for token security. So I'm, I'm really excited to have both of you today. Uh, welcome, Leah. Welcome, Itamar. Thank you. We're happy to be here. And, and I really you. like, yeah, thanks. I really like having uh, the two different perspectives on the call today, because I think it it shows how these early stage companies come together with technological expertise, but also uh, market and product expertise is so important. And uh, Israel just seems like the perfect place. I don't know if you saw the Wall Street Journal op-ed op today, which is uh, now is the time to invest in Israel. I'm, this is not an investing advice, but it it does. <laughs> it is for sure a fact that Tel Aviv and Israel is a place where uh, ideas and capital and entrepreneurial ex execution uh, are, are are on very fer uh, fertile soil. So um, before we dive into what's going on at Token, I'd be interested in each of your journeys, Leah and Itamar. You each took different paths, Leah coming up the venture capital path, Itamar coming straight up technical path. What, what was it in your background that led each of you to start this exciting uh, new company? Leah, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, so I, like I said, moved to Israel uh, six years ago, kind of with the goal in mind of immersing myself more on the diplomacy uh, and government side of the world and was quickly introduced to the high tech scene here and kind of felt that it was the place that I needed to be uh, and get involved in and started that journey um, at an early stage accelerator program called Mass Challenge and helped very, very young companies kind of on their initial journey uh, soon after that, moved to the VC side, um, and I was working at a cyber VC for about. And, two and before years. that, you were in Massachusetts, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so working for uh, a cyber fund here called Glilot for about a year and a half, supporting uh, their companies on the post investment side of things, and that kind of gave me the gateway to the cybersecurity market here. Um, and then moved to another fund that was more generalist. Uh, where I kind of built the motion to support all of their companies uh, on the post-investment side. But I kept finding myself going back to uh, the cyber companies that we had invested in and really wanting to immerse myself um, in the space and got the chance to work closely with Itamar. Um, and kind of one thing led to another, and I made the jump from VC to startup. And after that, I'll probably never look back. <laughs> awesome. So you're on the other side now. And Itamar, yeah. you... You came up the technological side uh, of the of the uh, entrepreneurial journey. How what did it take to go from staring at code and IDEs all day to saying, "Geez, I want to be an entrepreneur and uh, go over to the other side and 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 build a product." Look, uh, th that's a that's a great question. Uh, I, so I started as an engineer when I was eighteen. Actually, before that, but as a professional when I served in the army. So similarly to a lot of uh, um, Israeli entrepreneurs, this is like the best university to learn how to create um, products and, and, and solve real life problems. And very early on, I became an officer and a team leader. And when you are 20 years old and you're managing 20 different software developers, you're just uh, starting to understand that there's a lot of capabilities and there's that you can do a lot of different stuff. So I fell in love with cybersecurity. Uh, the CISO of the unit basically was my mentor. And we together developed different security products for the infrastructure and data of this intelligence unit that I served in. 
But what was really special is that in a very young age, I had to manage and lead a lot of different people and create a product. So I really fell in love by, in solving problems that uh, um, security practitioners face. And, and yeah, that's what led me to token security. Nice. Well, it, it's uh, it's great to hear the the entrepreneurial stories are always so fascinating about what it takes for I think inspiring for a lot of people to hear what it takes to to make the leap uh, to to building something from scratch and and you've both chosen a really uh, underserved area in the market in non human identity uh, it's a problem for tons and tons of companies um, and it. And I always find these things interesting, like um, like seeing some of these markets develop over time. You know, uh, the CSPM market developing from kind of nothing to a big market. This even if you go back to the SIM market, um, you know, I remember when ArcSight first came along and became a billion dollar product because of uh, it wasn't like people didn't realize logs were a problem, but they just never came to the top three priority of a CISO list to actually go and solve. And so I feel like non-human identity might be similar in the sense that people have known it's probably a problem for a long time, but maybe now they're connecting the dots from some of the really large breaches at Capital One and Snowflake where non-human identity played a major role. Um, Leah, maybe start with you since you're on product market fit. Like, are yeah. companies connecting the dots on how non-human identities, like, do they understand the diagnosis of the problem? And are they getting on board with, this is the time to actually start doing the work to solve this? Like, where do you think companies are at generally in the market? Do they understand it's a problem? And do they think it's a priority to go after? Yeah, so I think it's a combination. I mean, I think we'd like to think, yes, uh, that companies are connecting the dots. I think NHIs have really kind of become the backbone of a lot of automated processes and digital operations within companies today. Um, with that said, I think there's still a lot of room for market education. As you mentioned, NHI has become a very hot topic uh, in light of a lot of recent breaches, but it doesn't always necessarily translate to a clear or direct understanding that implementing an NHI platform is the best next step. And I think when you look at a lot of the most recent breaches like Capital One, uh, Snowflake, also Okta, Circle CI, SciSense, a common theme that you kind of see was that these attacks took uh, a route through non-user access credentials. So API keys, tokens, uh, service accounts, and secrets. And that kind of creates a breeding ground for, for a hacker's dream, right? They don't have the same security measures like user credentials do when you think about MFA or SSO. Um, and on top of that, a lot of these non-user credentials are over permissive, ungoverned, um, and never revoked. So when you look at these breaches, I think that it's Slowly. And then people may not even know they're there. I mean, that's the other thing. Like, I, I feel like right. sometimes it's like, you know, your user account, but you click a button and things happen. The things happen yeah. because of the service accounts that people might not connect from A to B without exactly. them, but they don't even know they're there. Yeah. And I think that people don't always understand exactly the breadth and depth of how many non-human identities are within their environments. And we always kind of talk about the stat that, now non-human identities outnumber human identities by up to 50x. So wow. really hard to get that complete inventory. Um, plus, when you layer in the fact that rotating uh, these identities without necessarily knowing what systems are dependent on them, it can lead to a lot of larger problems like infrastructure disruption. So I think that people are understanding uh, that this is something they need to start thinking about, but it's kind of on us as someone who's, you know, pioneering an NHI solution to help them understand what are the right steps to take um, and really connect the dots between what's happened and the right measures to take to ensure that they won't be the next victim. And, and ha that, that's a great explanation. I, I think I share your view on the on where the market is at today and that a lot of the realization and connecting the dots is still ahead of us, but probably mm -hmm. not so far ahead of us because I think you you listed off about seven different major breaches. Uh, this we only have twenty minutes on this podcast, so like we don't even have time to do all the all the list of all the breaches uh, that have had NHI as a con major contributing factor. You know, going from diagnosing, you know, I, I'm fat and I smoke, 
uh, uh, which one should I which one should I go after first weight loss or smoking cessation and which way should I do it like that's the choices that a lot of security leaders have today uh, going after you know choosing this diagnosis to be the one that's going to go to the top of the list of priorities for a security organization the list of threats is huge what what do you think the aspect the key aspect and maybe I'll direct this to Itamar when we think about the blast radius is the n plus one access to be able to leverage that across different systems do you see this is the biggest problem that in the industry that NHI can solve or what what do you see as the the threat that will be the catalyst that will cause people to really say this is a top three problem for me in 2025 uh, look, I, I think it's becoming a uh, um, uh, top three uh, problem to solve. A lot of the security uh, practitioners we talk with have uh, in their agenda that they're looking to solve this problem. And I think that the blast radius is absolutely one of the biggest challenge when it comes to non-human identity. Because if you think about the root cause of this problem is that non-human identities are decentralized. You, there's no one place for you to look and say, hey, this is all my non-human identities like you have with your human. And what it caused is a lot of different technologies that each one has their own user directory, their own IAM technology, and their own permission settings. So other privileged identities, when it comes to non-human identities, is usually the norm, and the blessed register is huge. But it's not the only problem when we think about life cycle management mm -hmm. for workforce for human, we have a really good process of onboarding, offboarding, moving between teams. But when it comes to non-human identities, because they are ungoverned, because they are, because they don't have visibility to those identities, I don't really have a process. So it starts with onboarding, ownership of those identities, key rotations, uh, least privilege, and also at the end, deprovisioning. So usually the first low hanging fruits when it comes to non-human identities, just remove all those inactive identities. It's a huge piece of the attack surface that I just have in my organization. When we work with some organization, they have so many legacy and uh, almost over a quarter of the identities are inactive. So let's just remove them, rotate those keys that are with high privilege and, and start to create a process. So, so that's, the, I was going to ask that as well as in terms of a starting point, I think I do think Leah is correct that um, that companies do understand that there's a problem, but they might not know the starting point. And you talked about provisioning human users. Well, a lot of that goes back to an HR department that says you're an employee, you're not an employee. Uh, that's kickstarts provisioning, deprovisioning. There's no HR department for non-human accounts. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? Who is that authoritative source can be interesting. So I think starting with attack surface management as a as an early goal seems like a way to get a quick win. Because I think the second point to making it a priority is one, understanding the impact and the threats. Then two, I think CISOs and security organizations in general want to go after solutions where they feel like they can get a win. And they can feel like in this calendar year, I accomplished X, Y, or Z goal. So reducing a tax surface seems like a worthy goal. And going back to Snowflake's example, that's one of the first things um, in the guidance from Snowflake uh, from their May incident was to start removing accounts that you're not using and turn off network access. Are there other things that you would look at out of the gate, uh, Itamar, for suggesting companies get get started? Is it is it about visibility? Is it about locking down network permissions? Is it about um, rotating keys? What are the other kind of early quick wins that you that you suggest to companies? Yeah, so all of the above. Uh, I think it starts with visibility and removing local identities. So unfederated identities is a big problem, right? Because when you have local identities, they don't have the same process of uh, managed technology. So removing those local users in your database, uh, federate service accounts of your Kubernetes to your IAM roles on AWS, and just create a more mutual trust will be a good place for just also remove those long lasting credentials that you need to always rotate and have a mutual trust that will help you 
create an easier process to manage. So I think this is a big part, but it's all start from visibility. The second part that I think that uh, you were mentioning was network uh, uh, restriction and hardening. That's a big problem, right? Because in order to do that, you have to understand for each identity, who is the act, who actually consume it and who are the owners of that identity. So I think a big problem of non-human identities is, is about the attribution layer. So who is the owner in my organization for that identity? And which application, what is the business uh, implication if I will now rotate the key? So after I inventory and creating one place to see all those identities, I have to prioritize because I have so many keys that are unrotated. I have so many problems. And the way to do that is both by bringing that context of who is the owner and what are the actual applications that are using that identity. So I think those two steps will help you then create a easier process and remove all those low hanging fruits for sure. And then you can move to more detection of anomalies and things that are a bit more advanced. Nice. And, and Leah, let me ask you on, on the customer value side, looking beyond security use cases, do you, do you see new value that companies can unlock by improving their hygiene around non-human identities? Can they, <laughs> is it, can they get better uptime, better resilience, some other things, or is this, do you see this as mainly a security play all day long or is it, or is it security plus something else? Definitely. Well, I think that, you know, right off the bat, it is definitely mainly a uh, security play, but I think it can go beyond uh, just that. I think it goes down to having better control, creating more well architecture environments um, and giving you that sense of better uptime and resiliency. And I think, you know, you're giving on the engineering and DevOps side, deeper visibility to really allow them to understand what the platform's actually doing, what's going on, uh, who they're talking with and the issues that might arise. I think, you know, there's always the sense of task overload that can take a lot of time. And when you think about um, all of the keys that need to be rotated and things like that, an NHI solution can help reduce that through the prioritization uh, side of things, because otherwise that's kind of what would become your full-time job. And I think another piece of it obviously falls under the compliance uh, side of things, which is a real business enabler. Um, so I think that it's a combination of mainly being a security play, but kind of extending to the broader uh, other facets of the organization. Right. And and there's a there's a new movement called zero standing that seems to be getting a lot of uh, a lot of momentum. Either of you have any thoughts you want to share on on zero standing? And does that does that is that adjacent to you? Is that your core value? Is that totally removed from where you are focused? What, what are your thoughts on zero standing? I think it's uh, the next generation for PAM solution. So it works pretty well when it comes to humans that want to access the different resources in the cloud. So, so it's, at the, today, it's at the intersection of human and non-human then. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And what we see today is an overload for DevOps team of uh, uh, giving permissions and removing those permissions. So having those just-in-time access solutions is uh, is is really valuable. I do think that uh, what we see is just a, a different way to look at the, the problem, which is, um, you know, how do I manage the entire life cycle of identity, the actual identity? And for for machine to machine, usually it's much more complicated to remit, to change the architecture of all the software that you created until now, right? So also convincing the entire uh, R and D team to change the way workloads are interact with one another. It's a big, big challenge. So I think that they are, we're adjacent to them, but uh, it's it's very interesting to see how uh, the future will look to those type of solutions. Yes. Uh, Leah, um, I've always been told in the years working with tech companies that product knowledge, you're on the product side and product knowledge is the hardest thing to find. So I'm gonna, I've got the last question is, is for you. Non-human yeah. identity is something that I think anybody who's done IT and security for five years or more knows is an issue, probably doesn't know how to deal with it. 
but it's also kind of a mouthful. So beyond all the details, all the areas for improvement, all the different use cases, all the starting points, all the different accounts, how do you, how do you think from a product standpoint to get people engaged and enrolled in this problem? It really seems to me like something that needs a catchy uh, product idea, like in identity, in the early days of identity, there were things like SAML and, and Liberty and all these different um, protocols, but it really caught fire when single sign-on came along. And nowadays you have things like zero trust and things like that. Is there, is there Leah Zuckerman, a, a zero trust, a single sign-on type use case for non-human identity, or are we just going to be talking in jargon terms forever? Well, I feel like you've really teed me up perfectly to kind of put on my marketing hat here. Um, when we talk about non-human identities, we kind of refer to it as machine first, right? We're starting the conversation with what we're focusing on securing, which is the machines. I think while we also support uh, securing human identities, we kind of prefer to make a clear distinction between what we're really talking about. So humans on one side, machines on the other, and kind of what that connects to in your broader uh, environment. And I think exactly as you said, continuously saying non-human identity security solution is a complete mouthful um, and not so sexy. So we're taking forward the machine first approach to identity security and kind of putting the machine at the center of the conversation. Uh, so that's kind of how we, we think about it. Um, and I definitely think that we need to move away from saying, you know, non-human identity security solution because it's not going to catch on. Well, m machine first, I think you'll be really well positioned when our robot robot overlords eventually take over. Uh, they'll know yeah. that you were out there defending them, and I'm sure they'll really appreciate yeah. that. Uh, yeah. So. Well, <laughs> we'll, well, then, we'll separate when we get there. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, Leah and Itamar, I really appreciate your time today. I, it's the most exciting thing for me in these uh, podcast sessions is meeting entrepreneurs who are taking a creative approach to a, a really hard problem. That's exactly what you're doing. And uh, wish you all the best on your on your entrepreneurial journey. Thanks for joining today. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Avakasha. Mm -hmm.